CG animals are a crazy piece of visual effects. On the surface, these guys just look like some fur animated to move over some skin. But under the surface, these guys are absolutely packed full of details containing full digital doubles of their real-life counterparts' entire anatomy, from their skeleton, to their muscles, even to their body fat. All of these elements need to be built, animated, and simulated to move correctly before we can even start to think about the fur. So, as a VFX artist myself, and someone who's found themselves constantly going in and out of working on these CG animals over the last few years, I thought I should shine a spotlight on the behind-the-scenes workflows of these animals and discuss the tremendous amount of work that goes into making them. So, without any further ado, let's dive into the world of making CGI animals and take a look at the first step that the creation process every CG animal has to take, and that is 3D modeling. So 3D modeling is the process of building digital objects out of 3D geometry. And it's basically used for every piece of CGI you see on screen. From the characters you see in animated movies like Shrek, to the spaceships you see in modern Star Wars. Each one of these was handcrafted by a 3D modeler. Which means that, actually, 3D modeling is kind of the backbone of pretty much all 3D visual effects. Because every digital object you see has to have come from somewhere. And that somewhere is almost always the 3D modeler. And so when creating realistic CG animals, things are no different. They too need to be realistically modeled from scratch. But what separates the modeling of CG animals from every other piece of CGI is that their interior parts must also be modeled. You see, usually most 3D models are actually completely hollow and have nothing inside of them because if the audience is never going to see it, then why would the artists waste their time building things like the cogs inside of a robot if they provide nothing to the end result? But with a CG animal, all of their insights actually do provide something to the end result. Take a look at your house pet like a cat or a dog and watch them as they are walking around. They have all these little details going on under the surface of their skin. You can see their muscles bulge as they raise up their leg or their skin folding as it slides around on their bones and their muscles. And so if you want to create a realistic CG animal, then you're going to need to recreate all of these under the surface details as well, which means that they're also going to need to be 3D modeled. So before any other process of the production can really progress, it's up to the 3D modeler to craft a complete skeleton for the animal with all of its anatomically correct bones, plus an entire muscle system in addition to making their external skin. And so to do all of this, 3D artists usually have to go looking in some pretty messed up places because the foundation of any photorealistic effect is finding good reference that you can match your work to. Because from this reference, you can base as much as your work as possible on it and therefore in reality. And usually getting reference is pretty easy when you're trying to model, say, the exterior of the animal, because there's plenty of footage of tigers or cats or bears that you can go and look at and figure out how they're built. But if you want to model a skeleton or muscles or anything else inside of the animal, then the only place you're going to find good reference for that is going to be stuff like a butcher's shop or medical reports or perhaps after a car accident <laughs> and so on. So it can be a pretty gruesome job at times, but this also lays the foundation for everything else moving forwards. Because once these models are ready, then several other processes can simultaneously kick off. And the first of these processes is grooming. No, not that kind of grooming. In this context, grooming is the process of adding digital fur to the animal. And this is typically done by the groom artist. So groom artists are basically digital barbers and they handle everything hair related on the animal. So stuff like the animal's actual fur coat to their eyelashes and even down to little things like adding matted areas or clumps of fur or perhaps even the little bits of dirt that make dingleberries in the animal's coat. And in a way, grooming is a lot like 3D modeling, except rather than working with shapes like boxes and spheres like the modelers do, groom artists instead work with curves. And these curves are essentially tiny little lines of geometry that they spread across the skin of the animal to represent its fur. And it's to these curves that the artists do their work, snipping and growing and clumping and twirling every single hair curve until they get a photorealistic 
and believable result. However, womb artists pretty quickly run into one very big problem, and that is that, because of how many millions of strands of fur an animal can have, adding fur to an animal is one of the most demanding jobs for computer hardware in visual effects. Because the computer has to load in all of these millions and millions of strands of hair curves, process them, and then feed them back to the artist, who then wants to interactively work with them in real time. So because of this, a groom artist's days can often be filled with crashes and tears as they battle uphill against the overwhelmed computer hardware in a desperate attempt to groom this model. But eventually, by the end of this process, they will now have the actual shape of the groom defined as a very versatile piece of 3D geometry, which as you'll see later, a lot of other artists can now utilize. But before this, there's one more step which the groom artist has to take. And that is to establish the shading of the fur, which in non-nerd speak is to set the fur's physical properties and control how the fur interacts with light. Because right now, all you have is this boring, grey shaded 3D geometry of fur that's pretty much has a uniform relationship with all the light bouncing off of it. So what's going to breathe true life into this model and take it to the peaks of realism is correctly setting up its shaders. So the artists go in and set up things like the colour of the stripes across the animal, or how reflective its fur coat is, or how much light can pass through certain areas of the fur. And they even make changes down to the tiniest and most subtle levels by doing things like making it so that the roots of the fur are transparent, whereas the tips of the fur are more opaque, much like many animals have in real life. And for the groom artist, this is the cherry on the top of their cake, and it's the final stage of their work, which means now their fur asset is ready to be passed down the pipeline to the next department. But before we can talk about that, we have to discuss another process that kicks off right after the modeling is completed and alongside with the grooming, and that is rigging. So rigging sets off at the same time as the groom, which means that up until this point, all we've got is this gray shaded model of the animal and that needs to be passed on to the animators so that they can do their magic to it. But immediately, <laughs> there's a problem, because the animators actually have no way of interacting with this model. To them, it's just a static piece of 3D geometry that's essentially useless to them, as they have no way of pushing or pulling or just generally deforming this model into any kind of animation. So this is where the riggers come in. The riggers are kind of the middlemen between the modeling department and the animation department. These guys are the ones who set up or rig all of the controls that the animators need to actually move the model around and bring life to it. So they'll create these handles which give the animators control over every part of the animal, from the obvious areas like the legs or the tail or the neck, down to the more subtle areas like its ears or even its entire face. But for doing this, they're actually the very unsung heroes of the VFX industry. Because rigging is kind of a side process that isn't particularly flashy and doesn't have a specific tangible visual output, so it always kind of just gets overlooked, even though it really contributes a lot to the work of the animators. And without careful rigging, their lives would be significantly harder. So for example, in 2005's Narnia, for the film CGI Lion Aslan, the rigging artist actually set up the facial controls by looking at the underlying muscles of a lion's face and figuring out if a lion could talk, how would it do so? Which muscles would be involved in it talking? And from this, how would its face deform and bend as its mouth moved? And so by doing this, the riggers saved the animators a lot of work because now the animators wouldn't have to figure out all of these complicated facial movements for themselves because the controls they were animating with would just figure it out for them and appropriately deform Aslan's facial animation to look like that of a real talking lion. And now by doing this, the animators could better focus on their job of bringing life and emotion to the character. So rigging is just an incredibly important process to any animated visual effect, which of course logically brings us onto the next stage of the process, and that is animation. Because now that the model has been prepared by the modelers and the riggers, the animators can finally get their hands on it and really start bringing life to it. But their approach to animation here probably isn't the type of animation you instantly think of. This isn't those classic Disney animations with all those accentuated movements and lots of energy. Instead, the animator's job here is to accurately capture what happens in reality. So rather than spending their time creating all these high energy cartoon movements, instead they spend a lot of their time studying the real animal's movement and then trying to recreate that in the tiniest of details. 
So to begin, they gather as much reference of the animal moving around as they can, particularly trying to find reference of it doing what it's going to be doing in the actual movie. And then once they have this, they'll take the animation controls from the riggers and use them to deform the 3D model to match the real animal's movement, particularly paying attention to things like how the animal distributes their weight as they walk, or which way their tail moves as they turn their head, and even down to tiny little stuff like adding involuntary twitches to the animal's ears. And this maybe sounds kind of boring in a way, because if you're just copying something's movement, then where's the room for fun or creative freedom? Well, with animations like this, where the real artistry comes in is adding that subtle level of cinematic performance over the realistic movement of the animal, whilst keeping things looking real and not computer generated. So for example, in the 2019 Lion King adaptation, the animators had to have all of these animals singing and dancing and doing things that animals certainly wouldn't be doing in real life. But they still had to keep these animations bound to the rules of reality despite the fact that there's no way that you'd ever see a real lion doing any of this. Or another example of this is when, spoiler alert, Aslan dies in Narnia, and they had to find a way to portray human sadness via the completely different eyes of a lion. So there's a lot of artistry and skill here in keeping these fake animations doing impossible things in line with what happens in reality. Now, speaking of keeping things in line with reality, this brings us to the final two stages of creating these animals, and that is creating the character effects, also known as the CFX. This is the step where we can finally utilize all the stuff that the 3D modelers made earlier. In fact, this step ties together everything that we've covered so far. It takes those bones and those muscles from the modelers, in addition to the groom from the groom artists, and it blends it all together with the animation from the animators to create pretty much the final look and feel and energy of the animal that you see in the final movie. So what is CFX? Well, CFX is the process of simulating everything that goes on both under and on top of the animal's skin. So what do I mean by this? What is simulating and why do we do it? Well, because organic creatures have so much going on with them, it's often more efficient to simulate parts of their movement rather than to animate it. So for example, as animals walk, their muscles tend to flex and bulge up, and their skin tends to slide around across their muscles, bones, and tissue, causing ripples and folds to appear. And so if you want your CG animal to look correct, then it too is going to have to have all of this movement. And this movement could all technically be animated by hand, but this is far too much work for even an entire team of animators to pull off. Because there's just so many variables that have to play with and feed into one another that it would probably take them months just to animate one shot. And so this is where computer simulation comes into play. By allowing the computer to calculate all of these different variables at the same time, it can figure out how the data from one element, say the muscles, feeds into the next element, say the skin. So the CFX artist will feed the skeleton, the muscles, the skin, and the animation all into the simulation. And then the simulation crunches all of these numbers, variables, and assets, and calculates, for example, at which point during the animation should the muscles fire? And then when they do fire, by how much volume should the muscle inflate? And then when they do inflate, what effect should that muscle inflating have on the skin around it? And then how much should that skin that's being pushed around by the muscle slide around across that muscle? And the list of variables just goes on and on and on because there's just so much to consider when looking at how an animal's skin and muscles move around as they move. Which actually means that these simulations can take a very, very long time to run because there's so many numbers to be crunched. And therefore they also need a lot of overview from a human. Because I may have made it sound here like it's the computer doing all of the work. But this really isn't the case, because whilst it's the computer that's crunching all the numbers, it's the CFX artist who has to feed it all of these numbers in the first place. It's their job to define the properties of each part of the animal, and set up how each part will affect one another during the simulation. And from this, they overview the entire simulation process and eliminate errors as they occur. So the job of the CFX artist is actually a lot of trial and error, as often the CFX artist just has to try out a bunch of numbers, wait for them to simulate, and then refine them over time until they find the numbers that look good for the particular simulation. And because of this, it's a well-known in-joke between CFX artists that a lot of their simulations are just poorly held together by like duct tape, as having to calculate the movement of all of this stuff is just so unpredictable 
and that often the artists just have to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. And then by the end of this, they cram all this stuff together and eventually they maybe have something that works. So God forbid if the studio comes back at the last minute and asks for changes, because that simulation is probably a very, very tangled ball that they'd have to unravel for a long time to get anything useful out of. But by the end of this process, you now have the animal's skin animated to move by the animators, now with its muscles and its skin firing and deforming correctly, leading to a much more convincing visual effect. And this brings us to the final step of building this CG animal. The step before it gets passed on down the pipeline to be lit, rendered and edited into the actual movie. And that step is to also simulate the movement of its fur. Because you could just have the fur follow the movement of the skin and kind of just deform with it. And films do use this for wide shots and shots with lots of animals that would take too long to individually simulate. But the downside of this is that it doesn't look very realistic. Because it's not what fur does in real life. Fur doesn't just deform with the movement of the animal. Instead it kind of has a life of its own, bouncing around all over the place as the animal moves. Or perhaps even interacting with things in its environment, like wind or water. So because of how complicated this sort of movement would be for an animator to figure out by hand, much like the muscles and skin, fur simulation is used to calculate how the fur should be moving. So the CFX artist will set up all the properties which realistically match the movement of the real fur, and then the computer will calculate and crunch the millions of variables that go along with that. And then after doing this, the fur now has the movement and behaviour of the real fur, bouncing and twirling and curling all over the place and moving as the animal does so. And with that, we've reached the final stage of the animal making process, which leaves you with a realistic looking groom moving in sync with an animated animal, which has fully functioning muscles and skin deformation that's now ready to be put into a soulless remake of one of your favourite childhood movies. And from here, it moves down the pipeline to the departments we mentioned earlier, to be lit, look dev rendered, composited, colour graded, etc. The animal still has a long way to go before you see it in the final film, but I think all these steps are for another video, because they're a bit more generalised when it comes to the production of CG animals, and they're not as specific and tailored to this process as the other steps we've already gone through. So we can probably make whole videos about the general usage of each of these processes. So if that sounds like something you'd like to hear more about, then please feel free to subscribe and click the like button and leave a comment below with your thoughts. And if you want to learn more about this subject, I've left all of my sources for the video down in the description. Or if you want to learn more about VFX in general, then please check out some of our other videos where we discuss some of the craziest VFX and CGI used across the last 25 years of filmmaking. But otherwise, yeah, thanks for watching and have a great day.